This meeting is now being recorded. Liz, you can get started. Thank you and good morning all. And thank you for joining us today for part one of our Black Lives Matter Community Conversations on Racial Equity, Justice and Resilience series. My name is Liz Cedillo Pereira and I serve as the Chief of Equity and Inclusion at the City of Dallas. And in this role, I provide executive leadership oversight of six offices, the Office of Equity, the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, Office of Ethics and Compliance, Office of Fair Housing and Human Rights, the Office of Resilience and the Office of Welcoming Communities and Immigrant Affairs. This umbrella of offices strives to build and deliver equitable and inclusive programming to serve all Dallas residents. I report to the city manager, Mr. T.C. Brodix, who in turn reports to the mayor and 14 Dallas City Council members. Today, the Office of Equity and Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation have partnered together to host this webinar so we can have a dialogue and engage with the community around the need to lead with race. As the equity and inclusion team, it is our goal to center African-American voices as we strive to be better informed in our allyship and equity efforts. I look forward to having a productive discussion with all of us present today, and I will now pass the mic to Council Member Casey Thomas, the chairperson for the Workforce Education and Equity Committee. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. My remarks will be brief because I'm also a panelist today. So I just want to let everyone know that we, as the city of Dallas, saw a need to begin this conversation uh, to provide leadership for our city. Many people, as a result of the tragic murder of George Floyd, are having a lot of conversations about a lot of things, a lot of promises and commitments are being made. And it's critically important that these promises lead to actions. And that's why I'm excited that this first conversation will be centered around the topic of racial equity. And so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the gentleman who I've known for a little while now, who's very serious about this topic, who was born and trained and prepared for this very moment, my good friend, who we're working together to create racial equity for the city of Dallas and eliminate all forms of white supremacy and systematic racism, Mr. Jerry Hawkins. Thank you so much for the introduction, Councilman Thomas. Uh, my name is Jerry Hawkins. I'm the executive director of Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation. Our mission is to create a radically inclusive city by addressing race and racism through narrative change, through relationship building, and through equitable policies and practices. I'm really excited to be here today and to partner with um, our city in the city's racial equity office. Uh, my hope is that we uh, continue this conversation. So I want to start by um, really just centering um, the conversation by starting with a land and people acknowledgement. Uh, a land and people acknowledgement is when we acknowledge that we are, um, as a city and as a county, um, on stolen land. This is the land of the Caddo Nation. This is the land of the Wichita Nation. This is the land of the Comanche. Uh, they had stewarded this land for thousands of years, and uh, we owe them respect, we owe them reverence, and we owe them acknowledgement of that land that was stolen. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that this is a, a land where stolen people work. Um, Dallas, as a city, um, had slavery in it um, for a number of years. Uh, we acknowledge that um, people who were um, indigenous to Africa worked these lands and toiled these lands and that we want to acknowledge them and also uh, give reverence to those folks as well. Um, this conversation is centering um, Black Lives Matter. And so when we say Black Lives Matter, that is not just a statement. We have to mean that. And so we hope to uh, have conversation with the community about what it means to be accountable to that statement. Um, this uh, community conversation on racial equity uh, will center the black community. And so we want to 
uh, you know, join this conversation by talking about that. I want to, again, uh, remind the audience that they can put input um, questions and also any comments that you have in the Q&A box um, on the WebEx. And also you can add to the conversation by adding uh, in the chat. So please join us in those two areas as well. Um, now I want to give a moment for our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, I want to start with um, Dr. Lindsay Wilson, then we'll follow with uh, Councilman Thomas, um, Amber Sims, and Mr. Rolando Blackman. Uh, give, give them two minutes to introduce themselves and talk about their work on racial equity. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As Jerry mentioned, my name is Dr. Lindsay Wilson, and I serve as the interim equity officer for the city of Dallas's Office of Equity. Uh, I am excited to be a part of this authentic and much needed conversation around Black Lives Matter. Specifically, um, as Jerry mentioned, today we will be centering Afri the African American community uh, in our discussion. Uh, a little bit about the Office of Equity. Our office works to shape a city government in Dallas in which everyone can thrive. And when we say everyone can thrive, um, we specifically are looking at those who are not thriving. And in the city of Dallas, that is the black and brown community. Um, and so our office works closely internally with other departments uh, to support the policies, practices, and procedures um, in, in an equitable way. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, my name is Casey Thomas. I serve on the Dallas City Council. I represent District 3, which is in Southwest Dallas. Uh, my district goes against every stereotype that you hear about when you think about Southern Dallas. Uh, we have very, very diverse, predominantly African American. We have 90% single family homes. Uh, we have um, a number of individuals who have advanced degrees. So uh, one of the challenges that we have in District 3 is that we have a perception problem. There's a perception that because we are located in Southern Dallas that we feed into all of the stereotypes of Southern Dallas. We have one of the lowest crime rates in the city of Dallas. And so that's just a little bit about the makeup of my district, which is in the southwestern part of the city. My work on racial equity began about three years ago when our city manager got here. I began to have a conversation with him about a need for a chief equity officer, a need for us to develop equity indicators. City of Dallas was chosen by 100 really resilient cities to create a resilient strategy for the city of Dallas and we made sure our strategy was not focused just around uh, resilience, natural disasters, but we looked at resilience in terms of poverty and other issues. And we began developing this plan to address equity across transportation, across economics, uh, across health, across the environment. And we have 1.0, but we are beginning to work on uh, res resilience 2.0. And so I am glad and honored to be able to uh, say that we have an Office of Racial Equity. We stood it up with over a million dollars at the time, and we had at least three staff members, which was unlike a lot of cities across the country. At this time, every city should have an Office of Racial Equity as we deal with the challenge of the pandemic and we deal with the issue of unrest that hopefully will lead us to where we are now, not just the conversation, but actual actions that will help Dallas become one of the number one cities in racial equity across the United States. Hi, good uh, morning, good afternoon. Um, as we transition into afternoon a little later, everyone, my name is Amber Sims. I am the Director of Regional Impact, 
for an educational nonprofit um, called Leadership for Educational Equity. Um, and so in our work, we work along four pathways, which include policy, advocacy, organizing, and also elected leadership, putting um, putting folks who were formerly in the classroom into positions to influence um, things that happen not only in education, because we know education does not exist in a vacuum, um, but for what happens in society. Um, and so we encourage our members to you know, run for city council, but also school board, and then uh, putting people of color into policy and advocacy positions. Um, we'll talk about this later, but thinking that um, the policies that inform um, our day to day lives were created as racist policies. And so um, a lot of work we have to undo. Um, additionally, in my free time, I um, am the co founder of an institute called the Imagining Freedom Institute, uh, which houses Young Leaders Strong City, which is a racial equity summit for students and we also do racial equity consulting work and um one of the things that i'll talk about later as well is that history we have to talk about history and its place um and research and then find better solutions for a better dallas and so excited to join um, my co-panelists here and uh, be moderated by jerry hawkins mr blackman My time here in Dallas that it's been a serious situation in trying to make sure that there's an equitable need for people to be able to not only be educated, but to understand that black and brown people count. That's what's most important. I'm, 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 a, I'm I, I hear it from all sides. I'm, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I come from Panama City, Panama. I immigrated to the United States, got an opportunity to get an education in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Oh, yes, I said it, Brooklyn, New York. I got an opportunity to be in a, in a school system that put me exactly where I needed to be. And I think the important factors with all of that is not only the teaching, but the understanding and the, and the, and the vision that you give all the kids, that you, that you give an opportunity for a progressive environment, for respect, communication skills, listening skills, for, co for a collaborative effort. But as I tell everyone each and every day that I've walked in my life, that if, when I got here in 1981 playing basketball and making all-star teams, being part of so many different Hall of Fames, that's all gone now. The important factor is I stand here as Rolando Blackman, representing my class, my culture, the people around me, representing the people as a whole. And I think what's most important about that is that we're never going to get anywhere and having the understanding until we get the policymakers and people in power to be able to make those changes. What we're doing here today is so critically important but until we turn this into a voting aspect so we can get people to understand that they uh, can be out of office and put themselves in a position to being able to get things done, we don't want any more just kumbaya moments. We want to have the opportunity for real change, and that change comes in being able to have the policies done, and that's what I'm advocating and having the opportunity to get things in, in that way. So I'm glad to be part of the panel. It's a fantastic opportunity. Para los Latinos que están uh, papá fuera, hello, 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 and I'll talk to you very, very soon. Awesome. Thank you to all of the panelists for um, introducing yourselves. Uh, I'm looking forward to your comments. Um, Want to continue the energy that you all gave us uh, in saying that this is a, a long term strategy. In 2018, uh, Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation uh, joined with the city of Dallas and also Dallas ISD to form a racial equity coalition. Um, and in that coalition, we worked on the Resilient Dallas Plan. Um, if you all are in the chat, you can check out the Resilient Dallas plan that we worked on. Um, and, and as Councilman Thomas uh, stated, uh, that plan didn't focus on natural disasters or uh, climate change like other cities do in the 100 Resilient uh, Dallas or 100 Resilient Cities plan. Uh, the city of Dallas decided to focus on equity, which was really um, an awesome thing. The Resilient Dallas plan, as if you can check it out, is really um, an amazing laid out plan. And I, I think it's uh, really important that this, the city can check that out. And so this is a continuation of that plan. It is actually the third part of that plan. And so I want to, uh, you know, encourage people to check it out. So I want to start with uh, Dr. Lindsay Wilson. Um, as mentioned, the city of Dallas has an office of equity. Um, I think, you know, folks would be excited, excited to see that. Um, it was established as a standalone office in October 2019. And Lindsay, I want to know, can you expound on the Office of Equity's work? Absolutely, Jerry. Thank you for that. I'm excited to start the conversation. 
um, talking a bit about what the work that the Office of Equity does. And so, as you mentioned, as of October 2019, we became a standalone office. Prior to that, we were the Office of Equity and Human Rights. And so now we have an Office of Equity, and then we have an Office of Fair Housing and Human Rights under the directive of Ms. Beverly Davis. And the Office of Equity, like many offices across the country, focuses on the advancement of equity within government. And so, in other words, a vast majority of the work that our office does is internal. If I had to break it down, I would say probably about 70% of the work that we do is internal in partnership with other city departments and staff and supporting them and anal analyzing, excuse me, their policies, practices, procedures, responding, helping them respond to community needs during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, and the na national wide movement towards racial equity, and most importantly, helping them implement an equity framework that will not only inform their daily services or their daily functions and practices, but their service delivery. And so that being said, it's critical to note that the city was very committed to equity way before the Office of Equity. Um, and that work was really driven by leaders like Council Member Thomas, the city manager's office, the city manager himself. And through that work, we became a member of GARE, which is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity in 2018. And since the establishment of the Office of Equity, we actually adopted GARE's framework for our office work plan. And so when you think about the Office of Equity, you can think about our internal work in three specific pockets or categories. First, it's normalizing. Normalizing concepts, conversations, and the urgency around racial equity. And so what that looks like in our day-to-day -day practice, as you can imagine, is working closely with city departments and staff and things that vary from just kind of basic one-on-one -on -one the difference between equity and equality and, and helping departments and city staff understand um, what we mean when we're talking about equity and, and the urgency for it. The second category is organizing staff to work together for transformative change. And so we've done that through uh, our racial equity core team who went through over 40 hours of training with GARE, who have come together and worked on pilot projects around equity in workforce, equity in housing, um, equity in procurement. And the last category is operationalizing new practices, policies, and procedures that are equity oriented. And so what that looks like for us day to day, our office um, just went through this budgeting for equity process in which Across over 40 departments, we provided technical assistance and training um, to help departments develop an equity lens as they're thinking again about their daily practices, service delivery, um, and most importantly, the allocation of their resources. And so through this budgeting for equity process, departments were required to complete a budgeting for equity tool that uplifted four strategies um, and with 10 questions. And the four strategies uh, specifically ask departments to identify the ways that the allocation of their budget benefits and burdens communities of color. And while we said communities of color, our office was very specific in the technical assistance and training that we needed departments to be specific in their language. When you're talking about communities of color, who are you talking about? Are you talking about the African American community? Are you talking about the Latinx community? We need you guys to get down to the specifics as well as identifying the, the areas in which um, you're talking about. Uh, the, second, the second strategy within that budgeting for equity was data. And so having departments look at disaggregated data by race and social economic status, and then identifying how that data prioritizes or how they prioritize and plan based on that data. The other two strategies were community engagement and accountability for their equity efforts. 
And so if I can just touch just a tiny bit on community engagement, because historically what we see within cities and county um, and local government is when we say community engagement, Oftentimes, we're going out to educate the community, right? Educate the community on how to be um, effective within the realms of the policies that have already been set. We really push departments to think about community engagement in relation to how are you consulting the community? How are you collaborating with the community? How are you making shared decisions with the community? Um, and then once you make those or uh, gather some information from the community, how does that inform the allocation of your budget? And so that's just an, an example of the ways in which we operationalize um, policies, practices and procedures that are equity oriented. Um, we do do some work externally, about 30%. Uh, our office has a strong relationship with the Dallas ISD Racial Equity Office. Um, and then I'll end with this part, with, with, with my favorite tagline, which is equity is everyone's work. And so oftentimes people say, yes, the office of F the city of Dallas has an office of equity. Um, but again, it's really about the partnerships that we have internally, because in order for this transformational change to actually happen, Everyone within the city has to be dedicated to it, and it has to show up in the ways in which they are um, engaged in their daily practices and service delivery. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, it's a great explanation of the office, and um, I want to continue that conversation by um, talking to Councilman Thomas. Um, Councilman Thomas, uh, you know, you've had a, a, a really um, great uh, racial equity journey. Uh, a lot of people don't know your background. Um, as a as young person doing this work in the city, uh, but I know you as a person who can be held accountable and you listen and, and you know, I, I always push back on you. Um, but I want you to, you know, I, I want to also say that I'm really, um, you know, proud of you standing up for racial equity in the city uh, very openly and explicitly, uh, especially lately. And so, Councilman Thomas, as an elected official, um, you've been talking about racial equity uh, a lot recently at the, in the city, particularly um, you know, in the council. Can you discuss some of the city's commitment to equity uh, and actionable outcomes, um, if there are any? Definitely. First, uh, thank you, uh, Jerry. I know uh, uh, props from you don't come easy. So I appreciate uh, I appreciate you saying that. We are live on Facebook, so thousands of people heard you say that. <laughs> but- um, We gonna keep pushing yeah, yeah, too, brother. We gonna keep pushing. Oh, I know it. We're just scratching the surface. Um, but uh, I do want to, Lindsay, Dr. Wilson, made reference to this. I keep this close to me. Uh, this is uh, one of the Bibles that, you know, one thing I consider like a Bible, because this is our blueprint as a city for um, how one, as relates to um, our post-COVID plan, this is going to fall right in line with that. And then two, as we move forward on uh, addressing uh, racial inequities. so. First and foremost, a commitment. Um, I'm honored and excited to say prior to uh, a little bit over a year ago, uh, before the new council and mayor came on, we were able to pass a resolution on racial equity 15-0, uh, uh, just to make a statement saying we as a city are serious about this. Two, uh, I can say this because this just happened yesterday, the Confederate monument is coming last one that's in public prop is coming down the last little man that was sitting on top of that 60 foot he came down yesterday so all of the confederate soldiers officers etc that on public property are down and hopefully in the next uh 30 45 days we'll be able to take the actual structure down that's another commitment that we've made the fact that we committed as a city to uh utilize a racial equity lens with our budget, that will be done this year. We did as a pilot last year with certain departments, but then we have a commitment as well as a council that as we as we're identifying uh, locations, uh, testing locations for um, COVID-19, we're utilizing an equity lens for doing that as we're developing other priorities for the city our economic development plan and policy. I just met with the consultant the other day. It's going to make it's going to be uh, from an equity lens as well. And so 
our transportation mobility uh, plan and strategy we're developing. Uh, we have a commitment under under my leadership as chair of the Workforce Education and Equity Committee that we will do everything, everything, every decision uh, that we make, uh, even looking at how we do uh, our contracts with uh, with those who are providing services to our homeless. There's a report called the Spark Report. I want to challenge everyone to look at that report because it deals with racial equity and homelessness. We know that over 70% of the homeless population in the city of Dallas are black males 50 and over. This is documented. And so uh, we have to make sure as we make these decisions, we're looking at what the implement impl implications are and the implications are overturning a uh, systematic, racially systematic uh, white supremacist uh, structure by implementing policy changes that will benefit people in black and brown communities that will help them to get not only uh, have tools to get them out of poverty, but to reduce crime in the city of Dallas. And that's a commitment that we have made. Thank you, Councilman Thomas. Um, now I wanna bring in um, kind of our external partners. Um, Amber Sims is uh, somebody I consider a friend and a partner. Uh, we've been doing this work for a long time in the city. Um, when people, we were saying racial equity and people would look at us like we're saying a, a foreign language. Um, Amber, um, you know, as someone who has um, helped the ISD's racial equity office uh, become uh, something that is now existing um, and also Richardson's equity office, um, what are some of the, the most um, especially when we talk about our, our black community, the most uh, you know, permanent as we see racial inequities that uh, our black community faces here. Um, particularly um, talk about you know, the communities in which we work in. So, so give us some of those things. Then I, I guess my follow-up question to that is, um, how do we set some outcomes, particularly those that are measurable to address some of those inequities? Yes, we, we have to start with history like I mentioned um, in the beginning, and the history starts why I'm um, in our work, Jerry and I do a land and people acknowledgement, and we're gonna focus on the people part, is because black people in this country were initially brought here as enslaved individuals who built the economy for Dallas. And um, Dallas has benefited from that. We say very little about it, but it's very, very true. Um, the city of Dallas, how it's made up, how the roads are made, how the city is planned, um, started with a very racist history. And the other thing that we have to acknowledge is that it was intentional. That we intentionally segregated communities, um, that black people after they were um, emancipated, which the idea of someone being emancipated because they were enslaved is appalling, right? Because how can you enslave a person? But this country did and the city did, and um, what Black people did after they were emancipated was go and build what are called Freedmen's Towns throughout the city. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think about a lot is how these Freedmen Towns existed, but they don't exist now. And I know that people's patterns change, but also what I'm talking about is there is very little acknowledgement in this city of what it was and who was here. Um, right now, I sit, you know, on, uh, I, I live in very near downtown Dallas and very near Deep Ellum. I myself live in what was formerly a Freedman's Town. And when I walk around my neighborhood, there are very few remnants of that fact. Um, and it's disappointing um, because Black people built the city and Black people continue to build the city. And what is our acknowledgement of that? I start there, you all, because we have to acknowledge what has happened in the city to move past it. Uh, we have to acknowledge that there were, you know, where I live, three Freedmen's Towns, um, one being Stringtown, and I want to focus on that one especially in um, the Bottoms area, um, which is the 10th Street Historic District, is because when you go back and read about this places, these places, you all, they talk about how there was no running water and there were no sewage systems, and Black people during these times suffered from very poor health factors. And we fast forward to 2020, and what's different? 
When we think about COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact that has had on communities of color, particularly black people, it makes us want to dig into this history a little deeper. And, you know, I would be remiss to not remind us that we don't even have the full data about the impact of COVID-19 on the black community because the data was not completely collected by race. You know, and so in some ways we can't even talk about what we need to talk about because the data is incomplete. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want to move on to um, to the fact that in, you know, near downtown, um, Jerry and other faith leaders from um, Faith in Texas uh, hosted a rally, right, that started um, at the place where um, Alan Brooks was hung, right? He was murdered um, in downtown Dallas and that history is pervasive here and um there's you know right now there are currently no memorials um, but when i go to a city like atlanta where is where i went to college you know they have a um a whole gateway a, a series of plaques and monuments about the black history in that community um and so one of the things that i want to talk you know that i think is important to talk about is how do we want to remember the accomplishments of the black community here and pay homage to that because uh, we haven't done a great job up to this point, and I think we should be very honest about that. But what will we do differently? Um, and then, um, you know, the other thing that I'll say is that whole uh, communities in Dallas, uh, Deep Ellum and um, 10th Street and other Black communities were destroyed when the freeway system was put into place. Uh, these these freeways and these highways literally divided our black communities and um even the state fair um fair park right um they they used eminent domain to take over housing love field which is uh where the elm thicket community is um used eminent domain as well to take over black people's houses and there was never restitution there were never reparations people were never given you know um what they were rightfully due and so, you know, I can't tell you how much the properties in short North Dallas were worth, but I can tell you, right, that there was an um, AT&T uh, arts faculty that was built there that was worth $300 million. I can't tell you, um, you, you know, when we think about the bottoms and how much that land is going to be worth. Um, right now, I can't tell you exactly what it's worth, but I know that those houses and houses around there in the deck park are going to exponentially increase that. And so, you know, when we think about, you know, Jerry asked about outcomes and how do we measure success around racial equity and centering uh, the impact of black lives, we have to have practices in place, you all. Um, we have to, you know, uh, there are some historic districts that have named um, endangered neighborhoods in Dallas. And we have to take that very seriously, but then how can city policy and zoning be changed in those communities? Um, you know, you think about South Dallas, the property values have quadrupled in that community. And we are literally uh, putting people into a position into which they cannot afford to live in the communities that, you know, in the 1950s were bombed for black people to move in. And now there are intentional policies and practices and home evaluate home valuations that are making it impossible for people to live there and in other communities like Elm Thicket. Um, and so, you know, I want to propose that we look at these communities very seriously and begin to put in new zoning, begin to put in ways in, in which we can, I know that this requires working with the county, um, but rethink the way that we value property so that those folks, so that folks can stay in communities. But then we've also got to think about not just our elders that are in those communities, but how do we make it affordable for young black people to afford homes in the center of Dallas? And right now it's very, very hard. Thank you so and much. If we want black people to be here. We've got to make ways for that to happen. And it starts with economics and money. Thank you, Amber. We appreciate it. Um, giving us that context. Um, Mr. Blackman, I have to say my uh, Latinx people are excited to hear that you're from Panama, first of all. Uh, so I heard I got some comments and some texts for about that. Um, but we learned in your introduction uh, about your commitment and your longevity to this work. Um, obviously, as a Dallas, a former Dallas Maverick, you're a legend in this city. Um, but can you talk a, a bit about um, how the conversation on racial equity is different than the conversation that we've had in the past? Mr. Blackman, you're on mute. Oh, 
you know, you know, why am I on mute? You know, Ro wants to speak. You know, Ro, Ro, get in there, Ro. Shoot. Um, we can hear you over again. You know, thank you, Ms. Sims. Thank you, Amber. You know, what's important about this whole thing is to being able to note and understand that the structures and how we apply things are very, very different. Um, Ms. Wilson talked about the allocation of budgets and how we utilize the implementation of how we learn the, the things that will make us proud and the things that we needed to get accomplished. I grew up as I am today, knowing and understanding about black history, about black culture, feeling and understanding and, and feeling proud going to school that when I had a white counterpart next to me or my own Latino friends next to me, I went to school feeling proud, feeling good and understanding who invented different things, the, the street lights, blood plasma, all kinds of different inventions all throughout. So my mind was steaming with, with the idea and thought and my back, my backbone was straight because I knew and understood that I was included in what this country was all about. It's very, very important. Now, now, as I come through the time, all the way through Kansas State University, getting my degree, putting all these things together, I get drafted here in Dallas, which is a very, very different scope. Um, you know, it's it's a fantastic thing. I played basketball here, all of that, great. And uh, all of those things were wonderful. But what's most important to understand is that the structural situation here is very bad, period. I don't want to fool around and blah, blah, blah. I think it's good that we all have hope, that we all work toward what we need to get accomplished. But understand that the razor's edge needs to be out also. You have to know and understand that the differences in why South Dallas isn't developed all this time, all of this time since I've been here, almost 39 years, is because it's, it's, it's institutional. It's from the people who are, have power, who want and understand what they want to do, how they want things to climb and move forward, and who they want to designate to have what kind of land, property, applications to the structure. All those things have to be done for us at the ballot box. We have to get people inside of the loop that can make these actual changes. We have these things going on all over the world. I go all over the world. I'm an ambassador to the Office of Drugs and Crime with the United Nations, human trafficking, child soldiering. I travel all over the world. And I see now on TV, on TV that people are here all over the world talking about Black Lives Matter. But what's important is that for right now, the institutional pieces have to change. Even our educational process, even what's written in the books for kids to read in their history books, it is absolutely ridiculous that they don't understand their own cultures and understanding the power that they have brought to this country so that they too can feel that they have been a part of what's going on. And also what's important is that no one understand that the allocation of funds is very important. The state of Texas has great amounts of funding. It's just a matter of where it's going and how it's applied. I came to this country speaking nothing but Spanish, but I had the opportunity to understand, to go to remedial reading classes from 6 a.m. in the morning to 9 a.m. School started, and I did that for three years so I can get up to speed on this, the, the, this, them, they, that, those. Why is there a big T at the beginning of the, of the sentence and a small T if I use it again in the middle of the sentence? Why is there a, but as a child, as a kid, you start to understand those things. You start to understand even after school, there's an after school program also to supplement and understanding. And also what's very, very important, and I talk about this all the time, is that even with our own teachers association, they bear the responsibility after they get the budget together, because we have to be able to get those legislators and people who are in power who talk a lot, say a lot of stuff, and I'm, and I'm talking about people who have budgetary power, say a lot of nice things, join a lot of nice groups, get a lot, a lot of nice posters put together, but at the end of the day, don't allocate the funds in the proper way to get things done. They, they, they stay in this little, little area, and then all of a sudden hoping that everything blows over so they can have the same institutional structure that they had before. All these things going on around the world has to stay, stay intact because the important factors with this is that kids need to know and understand the future forward also. Many times I go into DISD uh, auditoriums and I get a chance to speak about the future, get a chance to speak about the processes, get a chance to speak about the inclusion pieces. And when I mention inclusion also too, I wanna make sure everybody understands that I'm vice president of corporate relations uh, for the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, the inclusion and diversity was led by Gail O'Bannon and of course uh, our fantastic CEO, Cynthia Marshall with the Dallas Mavericks. But when you talk about the programs and processes, you've got to be able to have these kids understand what the future is all about. It is not just going to school. It's not just going about, I'm going to class and I'm, I'm registering and here, Rolando's here. That is not enough. You've got to have the teachers in progress 
in process so that they understand the future forward and can backtrack and teach the kid the line that it takes to being able to get there. There is a plethora level of highways for success, 30, 50, 60, 70 lanes, but a kid has to know and understand what that process is. I grew up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York, running around talking, talking trash with my friends and we yo in and we, oh man, we do it. Do the, but understand that that kind of language and understanding does not equate to moving forward in a corporate setting and movement forward when you're 18 years old. A kid has to know what's different in my neighborhood, what's happening there with my friends, great. But you have to know what the other side also requires. I just, yes, I said it, I just told you, requires. So, so you understand, I'm not speaking right now, I'm not speaking white. So make sure we all understand that. As I said this to Mr. Uh, Casey Thomas also too, Councilman Thomas knows and understands me. He, he's heard me say this in some speeches I've made when he's there. I'm not speaking white, okay? So understand that. I'm speaking in the way that will get me included in anything that I want to do anywhere around the world, all the way the process is. I get a chance to be heard and I get a chance now to be a part of what's going on. You have to know and understand that. And teachers, teachers, even from the neighborhood like I had in Brooklyn, have to know the path forward. You have to understand that it's okay to be around your boys and say, what up, we did them, they do this and that. And, and, and I don't want to offend anybody, but I want, to, I want you to understand that there is a path forward that puts you inside of that inside of the language piece and also inside of the, the the piece from Mr. Hinojosa who's there also too doing these types of things it's important to understand the teachers have to teach to the future you have to have kids know and understand to pull your pull your pants up present yourself in a proper way make sure that you have the opportunity to have a speaking communication speaking reading writing and communicating skills are more important for for African American and Latino communities than you're talking about math and algebra and what happened here. It's it's important that once they see you, people are all have their prejudices, but you have to know that you have to put yourself in the proper format to get them going and move yourself forward from the association to what things happen. But at the end of the day, I tell everybody all the time is to being able to now get those legislative people to be able to make sure that we keep this kind of heat on top of the legislative people to being able to turn this into voting power. Because right now, as I tell you, and I swear to you right here in Texas, all, all, all the people in power who are quiet, not saying anything, all of a sudden their, their mouths are quiet. I've seen people on Facebook all the time yelling and screaming and going off and all that kind of stuff. As soon as George Floyd gets killed, Breonna Taylor gets killed, all of a sudden it's quiet. Nobody say anything. Everybody's trying to let it blow over and, and, and right now trying to figure out what are we going to do? What kind of organization should we join? What do we do out here? How do we get our, how do we get our box of band-aids over there so we can have an inclusive piece of band-aids? At the end of the day, what's important about this is that we have to keep going, keep applying ourselves, making sure and turn all of these marches, togetherness, all the pieces into voting power so that we can get to the ballots and put people in who advocate for the things that move black and Latino uh, people forward. That's what's most important right now, the voting power and the accessibility to not let this die and to continue all the way throughout the elections to, to keep this power going so that the, the format can be that we're a part of it. I go back to South Dallas and North Dallas. I go back to the same things all these years and ask the question, why isn't it developed? And people can always have the lip service that I've heard all throughout the time and uh, say this and say that, but everybody is just waiting to, to consume, consume land, consume, 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 and, and, and not caring about the people that are down there and the things that are necessary and needed to being able to put it together. We have the money. We have the money. The important factor now is who's going to put it, who's going to put it to, to the process of having it help the people to be able to move forward. That's what's most important. Voting power and the opportunity for all of us to make the changes through the people who represent us. That's all I have to say for right now. All right. Muted, that is a, that is a great segue, Mr. Blackman. We definitely have the money, and I agree with that. That's a great segue into uh, this uh, next question, which I want to hold just to one minute because we have a lot of uh, great questions. So I want um, you know just start with uh, Dr. Wilson and uh, Councilman Thomas uh, really quickly. 
um, about accountability because we say we're doing racial equity, but what does that really mean, right? It don't mean nothing unless um, the community can hold us accountable. Uh, you know, for example, right now, you know, uh, one of my uh, folks who are really close to me, Marsha Jackson, um, is dealing with Shingle Mountain, right? This, these shingles that are in back of our house, right? We're saying we're doing racial equity, but we still have these conditions in which um, racism is happening, you know, uh, so particularly, you know, from the city's perspective, um, can you all give us an example of how we're going to, um, you know, be accountable to racial equity? What does that really mean? How do we get to racial equity um, from a city's perspective? Councilman Thomas, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Dr. Wilson. Okay. Just okay. for one minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, a simple way is, uh, you gave an example of Shingle Mountain, of course, uh, the court, we just got a, 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 a statement from uh, the court yesterday, a ruling from the court that um, we're waiting for, the city is, is asked the court to have the owner uh, of that particular property to be responsible for cleaning it up. but in the event that he doesn't, we have to look at as a city um, what the amount would be in order to get that done because the eyesore, it's an environmental concern. We just passed CCAP unanimously as a council um, in terms of uh, our environmental plan uh, to address clean air and things of that nature. And so uh, that's one in particular. Another is simple as uh, if there's an area in the city that needs infrastructure, um, in the southern part of the city, allocating the dollars necessary in order to provide the infrastructure, the water, the utility, whatever is necessary in order for to be able to for individuals that live in that neighborhood to be able to not have, live on the uh, have to use a septic tank, to be able to utilize some of the same resources and uh, that the city makes available as everyone else, just making that a priority, put it on the on the agenda, getting the votes necessary. It takes eight votes to get anything done around City Hall and make a concerted effort to do that. One last one is there's a lot of discussion about the budget and um, and defunding um, the police and reimagining public safety, which is the language of those who are advocating for that. Uh, we have a commitment from our city manager in this budget to come back with dollars looking at how we can you know, reimagine public safety and put some of the dollars toward either making sure that we have someone who's trained and skilled dealing with mental health challenges to address those type of calls or um, something as simple as reallocating funding for more parks, more recs, more quality of life, things to improve the quality of life of black and brown communities. And so that's how we put racial equity in, in, in action. We allocate the dollars and put the dollars necessary in order to make the changes that are needed. Thank you. Uh, really quickly, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, and if I can speak to it just a little bit about the from the normalization of it, as well as the organizing piece of it is, is leading with race. Right. And so using that data, data is one of the, the strongest assets that we have as a office of equity because it shows the patterns. Right. And we need to understand the ways in which um, these inequities show up. And it, it's vital to actively dismantling the root causes of why um, Berkeley Public Health uh, Amani Allen says that black people live sicker and die younger, right? And so I think for so long as a society, we've turned an eye and tried to blame it on individual behaviors in, in lieu of actually looking at the interconnectedness of systemic racism and how it shows up in our institutions, how it shows up um, and the structures and, and so forth. And so a, a, a part of that is, is normalizing that conversation as well as organizing around how we get to the root causes of instances like that where it can be in, in certain communities. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, you know, very quickly to Amber and uh, Dr. Black, I mean, uh, Mr. Blackman, I'm starting with Amber. Uh, answering that same question, um, how do we hold um, our institutions accountable for racial equity? Yeah, um, 
part of the work that I've been doing with Dallas ISD is right, Jerry mentioned the racial equity policy, and then more recently it was the resolution um, for black students. Um, and so that's great, right? Um, the next thing that we want the district to do and what we're fighting for is much in the same way as Councilman Thomas um, mentioned that the city is doing in terms of public safety is we want them to defund um, in Dallas ISD as well, which has a $17 million um, police budget and reallocate those resources to um, more uh, social services and uh, counselors for students. And so um, the policy has to um, back action. And, um, and then uh, a budget tells us what an organization's priorities are. And so if you have a Black Lives Matter statement, you need to have some Black Lives Matter money, uh, um, you know, that, that, that really are allocated towards, um, towards the Black community and um, can begin to undo and unravel the harm um, that has been done historically through policy to Black communities um, by creating um, policy that isn't um, race neutral, but very race explicit in terms of dismantling um, racist practices that have disproportionately impacted and affected Black people. Thank you, Amber. Uh, really quickly, Mr. Blackman, so we can get to the uh, questions. One, well, definitely. Uh, so uh, when, when, when we talk about when we talk about uh, when we talk about this, well, what's most important about it is the, is the policy changes that are going to have to be enacted by the community. The community is going to have to stay in this in this knowledgeable in this knowledgeable state right now to being able to get the changes from the policymakers. Nothing's going to happen until we actually get deep inside the structural piece of, of, of what is here in Dallas, Texas, and also all around Texas is the same situation. You've got to be able to have the allocation and get together with banking members, people who own banks, people who, 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 who are the strength of uh, Dallas Fort Worth. There are so many billionaires and people here, but once again, I keep saying all the way around, all people have to be called out in, in, in a sense of making sure that they're in or they're out, but they, and, and it has to be a known factor. I've been here since 1981, and what's most important about it is that no one in power really wants change. They want to hide behind the veil, and what's important about it is to being able to bring it, bring them out from outside the veil. The last thing I'm going to say is that just just as we go through all these get-togethers with the police department and all the feel-good and marches and moving around, let's see how many of the police department to, um, uh, are there when we ask for the policy changes. When we ask for the when we ask for the citizenship council, when we ask for the for, for the police cameras, for the cameras that they wear to be readily available once asked upon in that kind of a situation, when, when when we have that immunity now taken away so that they can be just like every other citizen and have an opportunity, let's see who steps forward for that and who starts lollygagging and making a whole bunch of excuses. Nothing has been finished yet because we haven't gotten to the policy changes and the structure yet. It's all on the exterior getting there. Let's see who steps up when that time comes. And that's what's most important to see who does and who stays in the background quiet because they don't really want any changes. Thank you, Mr. Blackman. So let's get to some of the uh, community questions. Um, and I want uh, you know, our panel to step up for this. So Amani Thomas, she asked a really great question. What efforts will the city of Dallas make to reconcile with past disinvestments in Black um, Latinx, indigenous, and other mi uh, minority and in immigrant communities. I don't really use the word minority because it is a misnomer. People of color are the majority uh, in Dallas County. So uh, we're not using that word, sorry. But um, what efforts will the city of Dallas make to reconcile with those past disinvestments? Uh, I guess I'll start with Council uh, Councilman Thomas. Uh, thank you. And, and that's where we have this commitment from 10 council members who sent a memo to the city manager uh, suggesting, we didn't want to direct, suggesting that in the development of this budget, this budget, not the budget for the year after, this budget, that we reimagine public safety and we reallocate dollars from public safety to communities of color, black and brown communities, and that's how we began doing it. When we talk about quality of life, we're talking about access access to resources. Uh, I was on a call earlier with my public safety advisory council and we were talking about code and we were talking about the uh, the amount of, you know, junk, for lack of a better way of putting it, that we see in Oak Cliff and in Southern Dallas that they would not leave on the street for one day in North Dallas. And so 
these are ways in which we began doing that by reallocating dollars first in the budget to where we had the resources in order to um, level the playing field. And it's going to take a while. And I want to say this. I want to commend first uh, Ro uh, Black, my frat brother, uh, for all of his hard work and the things that he said. He spoke truth to power in a powerful way just a few minutes ago. So I want to commend him for that. But then secondly, as we talk about this we will need to make sure this is not a sprint it is a marathon a lot of people are waking up to something that many people have been fighting for in this city 20 30 when i was president of NAACP 10 years ago we were fighting for these very same things and so this is not new it's a marathon not a sprint if we don't get everything that has been advocated for in this budget let's go back to the drawing board let's stay involved stay engaged and let's advocate for those things to be included in next year's budget so we can eventually make the process progress necessary to level the playing field. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Thomas, y'all heard him. He says more pressure. So apply some more pressure. Uh, I think this question is for Amber. Uh, this is from Naomi. Uh, Naomi uh, asked, uh, how are we in Dallas specifically advocating for and pushing storytelling of real and complete history of Dallas and Texas and the U.S. and our schools, communities, et cetera? Uh, she said she appreciated the land acknowledgement and the people acknowledgement, and I, I'm going to direct this one to Amber. Amber, how are we uh, specifically advocating and pushing for uh, storytelling of the real and complete history? Yeah, um, Naomi, I think honestly, it's it's by starting, um, you know, Jerry, myself, and then our colleague Robbie have um, the Imagining Freedom Institute. And um, also six years ago with some community folks um, started Young Leaders Strong City because we realized that students weren't getting access um, to conversations about race and identity, but also students didn't know history. Um, and, and so, you know, we talk a lot about um, as a person that works at with Dallas ISD, that Dallas ISD was started as a segregated district. And that's important to know um, because it's still segregated, right? Like there is a desegregation except for it was only in name and not in what happened. And so um, Naomi, it's sitting at the feet of elders, right? In addition, um, it's doing community work, you know, with some great community leaders um, that are in spaces, you know, it's going to the African-American Museum to support Dr. Robinson and Dr. Delaney, who is now there. Um, it's supporting the South Dallas Cultural Center that has existed um, because of the work of Vicki Meek and um, Marilyn Clark um, in talking to Ms. Ragsdale, right? Um, and it's making sure that those stories are um, immortalized somewhere. I'm very interested after visiting Atlanta they have um, the Auburn Avenue Research Library of, uh, for African-American um, life. And I'm wondering what something like that could exist like in Dallas um, to be a storytelling project and to exist in a space in which we can tell the Black stories of Black Dallas and make sure that they live on um, and also that we get our due recognition. Thank Jerry, you, can I piggyback on that? Sure, really quickly. All right, sure. Well, oh, sorry about that. Won't take me long. Once again, I got props. This. I want to commend my good friend, State Board of Education member Aisha Davis, only African American female on the State Board of Education, who successfully, unanimously got African American history curriculum approved to be taught statewide throughout the state of Texas. We're talking about Texas. And this history book starts with history in Africa. It doesn't start on a plantation in America. It starts talking about the, the great dynasties in, in Africa and the transition from there to, to so many uh, contributions have been made here by African-Americans in this country. But as you add question, I want to give her props to make sure everyone that's listening knows that we now have black history classes available as an elective at every high school in the state of Texas. Push those state, your school board members to ask for this to be offered because the state board has already approved it. And then the next step is just to make that mandatory. Um, and so rather than it being an elective to make it mandatory for all students in Dallas. That's great, Casey. So thank you all for that. Um, this next question is for Dr. Wilson uh, from Bridget. Uh, she asked, does the Office of Equity partner with uh, corporations in Dallas to continue spreading awareness? So I would say, a Specifically, um, more that relates more to the equity and inclusion team overall. And so within, uh, as Liz mentioned, 
as Chief Liz mentioned when she opened, there's a number of offices under the equity and inclusion team. And while the Office of Equity is still fairly new, um, we as an equity and inclusion team, there are some corporations that we do uh, collaborate with or partner with. And Liz, I don't know if you want to chime in, but she might be um, better to speak on that than I would. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll give Liz a chance if she's here, but if not, we'll go to the next question. Thank you for that response. Um, I want to now uh, have uh, Mr. Blackman clear up some things because I have a couple of friends in the chat, uh, Akila and Haysong. Uh, they want to know if you are really advocating for assimilation or you're advocating for respectability, um, particularly with um, the premise that we're talking about is racial equity. Mr. Blackman, can you speak to if you're advocating for assimilation or are we talking about racial equity? You know, I'm not talking about just a, um, assimilation. What I'm talking about is to being able to being able to be part of the path. In other words, understanding what the path is all about. We live in a place that we live in a place that 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 has abundance of racism. Please understand that you have to go through this whole thing in a in a in a racist society. I myself, as a as a person, Rolando Blackman, walk out of my house sometimes, and I'm understanding that some days I'm recognized as Rolando and get treated as a normal human being with value and respect go through that whole situation. Some days I'm just recognized as six foot six black guy and I have to hold, hold, hold until those other people around me understand, understand that I am a person of worth. I am, I have, I am a, a college graduate. I have accomplished some things. And then I have to hold as a black person to being able to now come across and give them a chance to absorb the fact that I'm included in what's going on here. And I am a, 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 a person of worth inside of this whole thing. What I'm talking about is, the, is not assimilation. What I'm talking about is to knowing and understanding the path. Understand that inside of Dallas-Fort Worth, outside of Dallas-Fort Worth, when you step out into the world abroad, that you have to have a, an opportunity to show yourself in, in, in a way that you can move yourself forward. When I talk to people all the time, and it's always been said in that way, when you talk about the words, the language, the opportunity to apply yourself, there is nowhere anywhere that you're supposed to be walking around with your pants down with your t-shirt on and and cannot speak cannot talk those kids are the kids i'm talking about to being able to know and understand what the path forward is to being able to include yourself into the application of life open up the lanes of highway for you so that you're moving yourself forward you can so show, mr black man just for me i want to clear that up because i was one of those kids you know what i mean me too so, but listen me so, too me so too. we want to we want to clear that up because we know that uh respectability politics if you're even i've been stopped by the police in a suit i've been stopped me uh, too you know so so we know that clothing won't save us um so can you can you can you just give us a little bit uh more clear uh perspective on what you mean by that what i mean by that is by by being able to apply yourself being able to apply yourself at the age of 18. What I'm talking about is getting to that age of 18 when you can apply yourself for a job, put yourself together inside this, inside, inside of the system, or having the opportunity to be heard and apply yourself in a way where you're giving up ideas and thoughts where other people can help you. But you have to have a semblance of what of what the norms are, what the norms are. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what the norms are. You don't have to go work for somebody. You can have the idea and the application of, of putting yourself out there, putting the ideas together, and someone can listen to you and understand what's happening and be a chance to apply yourself to being able to move yourself forward. What I'm talking about is to being able to be included into what the into what the streams are. That's what that's what I'm talking about. Being able to apply yourself in that way. Being having a suit and tie doesn't get you anywhere. You still get stopped by Dallas police. You still get pulled over. You still get followed at the, at the department stores when you walk around in that kind of a way. It's still a situation that's, that, that's there. But once you get to the nitty gritty of sitting down in front of a banker, getting to a corporate structure, having the opportunity to put yourself inside of that phase, having the opportunity to explain the processes of your ideas and thoughts, there has to be some kind of a, there has to be some kind of a, a piece of the puzzle that matches with what you're trying to do inside of the greater society. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you so much for that. We're gonna get into that some more because I have some. I'm 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 gonna have an offline conversation with you about that. I want to hear let's more. Let's flow. Let's about flow. That. I'm I'm in yeah. with you. I'm in. Appreciate it. So let's go back to the city of Dallas, uh, Councilman Thomas and uh, Lindsay uh, for a minute because I have some COVID nine questions. One of the best people I know in the world, uh, Kayla, has a question about what's being done 
um, to collect data about uh, COVID-19 with black people in Dallas, if anything is being done at all. Uh, she says, what's some uh, tangible examples of what the, uh, the city and the office is doing to address the, COVID, the impact of COVID-19 on black communities? Yeah, I can certainly start talking about what the office is specifically doing. And so as, as soon as we began to see the disproportionate rate, not here in Dallas, but what it looked like across the country, my office, Office of Equity, and the Office of Real Resilience came together and created an equity impact assessment tool. And really that tool was modeled We good? We're good. We're good. <laughs> that, sorry, I heard feedback. Really, that tool was modeled off of a tool uh, in King County, Washington. And the tool helped identify the communities who were at the highest risk, um, not just for COVID-19, but vulnerable to the prolonged hardship, right, with less resources for recovery. And so within that tool, again, my office, Office of Equity and the Office of Resilience came together and pulled data looking at three specific factors. We looked at race, we looked at social economic status, and then we looked at age because we know COVID-19 disproportionately impacted the elder as well. And so collecting data, we were able to identify different um, zip codes and in some cases by census tract who would be at the highest risk again for COVID-19, but also the prolonged hardship. And so within that tool, we collaborated with various um, other departments um, and they used it as a resource. And so one of the resources that the tool was used for was when it was time to decide which zip codes um, were we going to initially uh, provide mobile testing for. We also, the tool has also been used um, through what we have, um, uh, equitable, uh, what is it, uh, equitable health working group in which we pulled together to look at the disparities um, within COVID-19 um, and moving forward with our efforts. And so within that group, the Parks and Rec actually worked on a face covering initiative. And instead of saying, hey, we're gonna pass it out equally across all of the dist districts, they were able to use that equity impact assessment tool and say, let's start with these specific areas because we know that they're higher at risk um, for COVID-19. So that's one of, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Thomas, do you have anything to add? What is it about the city's response? Because there's been, um, you know, we're getting four different responses. We're getting a federal uh, message. We're getting a state message. We're getting a county message and a city message. And those are all different. Can you give us some clarity, uh, Councilman Thomas? You know, your time, it could not have been better. I was just appointed by the mayor to chair the, 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 the newly combined COVID <laughs> response committee. Um, just real simple. And I'm glad Lindsay said what she said. You know, and I called a special call meeting and I know uh, uh, Liz and Liz have probably never seen that side of me before, but you know, we wanted to make sure that these communities that are being directly impacted by it, we had a strategy specifically to provide needs as it relates to internet access, as it relates to food, as it relates to transportation, as it relates to information. So, you know, and I get a week, I get a monthly update on what we're doing from an equitable standpoint, racial equitable standpoint, because there are five zip codes, five zip codes that were uh, decided, were determined by that racial equity lens to have be the ones that are most impacted by the least acts. One, in terms of those who are tested positive. Two, those who don't have access, access to testing or information. When we did the mobile testing, those zip codes were the zip codes that we provided the mobile testing for because as Lindsay talked about it, Dr. Wilson talked about, because we had data, because we had the data to show that, which is something in the city of Dallas we haven't done very well in the past. Data-driven decisions allowed us to make equitable uh, uh, decisions and, equitable, uh, and provide resources in an equitable manner because when we're talking about communication into these communities, we can't just put something on social media. 
and hope they get it. No, we have to either go door to door. We're putting yard signs out. We're doing, we're, we're doing by any means necessary to make sure one, people have the information. They know the risk. They know how high they are in terms of those zip codes. And so they're informed and then they have access to information that's going to help them make better decisions in order to be healthy and to save their lives. Really, this is a life or death situation and we want to save lives. I'm glad you said that, Councilman Thomas, because we got to definitely do better. Uh, that NPR article about Dallas testing sites was definitely disturbing. And the fact that Dallas County is now a top five COVID-19 spot is also disturbing. So we got to do way more for our community. Um, this is a question for Amber. Um, May I just add, Jerry, that that sure. NPR story you, covered. Sure, just wanted to add a point of clarification on that. Um, the NPR story was important to amplify these issues. Certainly agree. But what it, it covered was all testing sites, both private and government sponsored. So the city of Dallas, along with our partners at the county, with federal assistance, are using this equity lens to place sites and access points where we mo where we know we most need them. So I make that little point of clarification. No, that's a really great point. But this is actually a, a great segue to the next question, and it's about um, having like access in, in in opportunity deserts, right? And so, as a historian, Amber, um, why? And this is a Toyin question. Why does Dallas have areas of food desert? And I can I guess that can apply to a lot of different types of deserts, right? Or, or places where opportunity or access is not had. Why does Dallas have that, Amber? Yeah, and this reminds me of like a few years back when um, Councilman Thomas was advocating for the grocery stores in the Southern sector. Like it's still, oh my God, infuri infuriating, right? Um, but you know, that that goes to what businesses are looking for. And um, even that work, right, is seeped in stereotypes about the spending power, right, of the black community. And then also, you know, seeped in um, misnomers and, um, and, and data, right, about um, inventory and stealing and all of these narratives play and, you know, come into play, um, you know, in food deserts, like it, it becomes more of a um, more of a, you know, like a symptom of what is systemic. Right. And so historically, um, these communities have been disinvested in um, and the disinvestment, you know, came um, from hmm, it came from a lot of different places, but in some cases it came from um, when white communities moved out, right? Um, it came from when the tax uh, money that's coming in is slower. It comes from the fact that the money um, I manage the workforce center um, in South Dallas at City Square. Um, but it comes from the fact that the best job you all that I could get someone um, a good job at the workforce was $17 an hour, which equates to around $34,000 a year. Um, and if you have two or three kids, that's not a living wage. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, I say this to say that all of these factors come into place. And, um, you know, with a lot of the folks that I worked with with the TANF program, which is a tax assistance program for needy families, a lot of um, the folks that we were working with were women and black women um, are slated to make, what is it, 64 cents on the dollar in comparison to other groups. Um, and, and so when we talk about like spending power and um, income and all of these things, it's a factor. Um, but then also historically um when the tax base goes and when white communities have left we've seen historically over and over again um that not only have businesses but the city as well has disinvested um in key resources like sidewalks and lighting and um cleanup uh that would also make these areas more desirable um for companies to invest in as well um and so you know i think that with our with our power we've got to do more to show that these communities are worth um more than our time and our resources, but that we are going to center them and be behind to get the resources that they need. Thank you, Amber. I wanna ask uh, Mr. Blackman a, a, a very uh, direct question because we've seen uh, the Dallas Mavericks be uh, more involved in, in recent times and having conversations around race. I think uh, Mark Cuban and uh, some of the uh, other city uh, entities had a conversation at American Airlines uh, so I want to ask Mr. Blackman, what are, what is uh, the Dallas Mavericks um, doing to commit to um, continuing this conversation about racial equity? Well, the Dallas Mavericks are, have, have been involved and have always been involved all the way throughout, even even back in, for many many years, as far as the Dallas community is concerned. But but in hosting all of all of the talks, all of the pieces of the puzzle, there they're getting together with Dallas business 
Dallas uh, 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 groups, different Dallas organizations, and they're permeating that all throughout th all throughout the city. Not only with the police department, with business leaders, and with actual with actual people that can actually make a difference. We're talking here about also the ability to bring dollars into an applied program, which is going to be very important in anything that we do. We tend to have an opportunity to hear many different things that go on in and around the city, but the Dallas Mavericks are doing a fantastic job in being able to not only implement the talks and having the opportunity for people to come in and, and, and put their put their stamp on, on what the future should look like, but also they're they're spending actual dollars in order to 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 put many, many programs together so that uh, the Dallas Fort Worth can move forward in, in what needs to, to be applied. And Mark Cuban has been has been, has been a great highlight as well as uh, Cynthia Marshall in being able to, to lead the way is exactly what's important. But leading the way with actual reality though, the, the, the pompousness that goes on when I watch the news, when I hear many people speak, it, it's, it's really aggravating because at the end of the day, we've got to get to that ballot box and we've got to get to the people that are going to make the changes. We can form lines all the way we want to, but at the end of the day, we're going to see some of these same people that, that are around right now not step up for when we need the changes that need to happen in banking. I just went through that the other day, the same situation the other day. I have business partners all over the world in different cities right here in Dallas. I'm not going to name the bank yet as far as that's concerned, but the opportunity comes when African Americans and, and Black people are getting together and doing things and you're looking for a banking structure to help you. Those are the situations you go on. You, you present every single thing that you possibly could present. You put yourself in line to get things done. And all of a sudden, you get inordinate different kinds of questions. You get all kinds of different situations. And at the end, you take so very long to, 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 to move the process forward to be included into the financial scene. So we're talking about education. We're talking about the ability to vote. We're talking about banking and finance. We have to fight on many different fronts to change policy and have the opportunity to be included in what's going on. But the Dallas Mavericks have, have, are on the forefront and have, and, have, and have been on the forefront for, for many, many years now. Thank you. So I, I want to close out uh, by saying um, I wish we can get to all of the questions that we have, uh, but we cannot. Um, I think the city will make a commitment um, and I to make, make a commitment to uh, answering these questions um, at a later date there. We're going to continue these conversations. I want to close out with our panelists giving us um, and this is really brief, a 30 second um, closing statement on how uh, we can stay in touch with you all and also uh, join in with the, the fight for racial equity in the city. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Wilson. Um, give us a 30 second closeout, please. Wonderful. Yes. So I can be reached at equity at Dallas uh, City Hall dot com. And just keep doing what you're doing again equity is everybody's job and so i can't tell you how uh the protest has accelerated uh equity efforts uh, within the city of dallas to even be able to have a conversation like this right and i'm sure uh chair thomas can speak to that as well and so we all have our role um i i think well not i think i know everybody on this panel is for the advancement of racial equity um and so that that would be my 30 minute cap that's probably over 30 seconds thank you councilman thomas thank you one tune in for part two and part three both of them are going to be fire number two um i stay tuned for the work that the city along with Ro Blackman and his organization. We talked just, you mentioned the American Airlines Center. I was there for that conversation. I sat in the small group that he led. We both made commitments. We're looking to see how the city and his organization can work together as it relates to racial equity so we can really provide the type of, of impact that we have needed to make over 40 or more years. Thank you, Councilman Thomas. Amber. Yes, um, one of the questions that I saw that I wanted to answer is how can um, philanthropy help with uh, 
with this movement um, for Black Lives, and one of the things that I would say is in, invest in Black leaders. We know that Black nonprofit leaders and businesses are underinvested in, um, despite having very capable leadership. And so this is something that we have to push more for um, because it'll help build capacity uh, for these organizations, and it's much needed and much overdue. Um, in terms of you know continuing the conversation, the Dallas ISD School Board is having a meeting later today. Um, we are working very hard with a group called Dallas Core to um, reallocate those resources from the Dallas ISD Police Department um, to other resources for students. And so we um, encourage you to write to your DISD uh, trustee and let them know that you were interested in that, as well as this racial equity, which is also a push. And then lastly, if you're looking for racial equity consultants, contact the IF Institute, um, you know, because I know that the city of Dallas can't do it all, but it's these partnerships, right, um, and community work that is going to continue to do us forward. And so we're in this together, you all. And um, it sounds, you know, it sounds hokey, but it's true. And um, this has proved this more than ever. Thank you, Amber. Mr. Blackman. The important, the important fact is you're like able to get a hold of me at compete22 at an old email at AOL.com. Yeah, I'm old. I still <laughs> use AOL. The important, the important compete, the word compete, and then 2-2 two, two at AOL.com. What's most important that, 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 that we go through this whole program is that we start to collaborate with each other, each of these different organizations and groups to being able to put together the agendas and know what each other is doing and making sure that we have a we have a forceful stream going toward a, a subject and an objective that gets us all where we want to go, not individualize everything and move moving all around, making sure that we get a nice Colorado River over here and making sure that we put ourselves in that five line to be able to move ourselves forward and getting things done. So the collaboration, the communication and the opportunity to have a, a singular force when that election day comes, is going to be the singular key to being able to get things done. Thank you, Mr. Blackman. Um, I want to reiterate that um, the next conversation will be um, a focus on um, the Black community and justice. It will be held on July 2nd from 11 to 1230. So look forward to uh, information about that. I want to thank the city, uh, particularly the Office of Equity. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, Councilman Thomas, Amber Sims, Rolando Blackman, thank you all for your work. Um, I want to say that uh, Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation is committed to this work. We are an anti-racist organization and we are for everybody. This is not for you to help. This is your work. Uh, it is all of our work to end racism. You can follow us on Dallas TRHT on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, our website is DallasTRHT.org. I also want to uplift some of the Black organizations like 4 Cliff. Uh, support them, give them some uh, love, boom, uh, Imagining Freedom Institute, uh, Young Leaders Strong City. There's a lot of uh, black organizations doing some great work, so please support them. Uh, again, we appreciate you for being here. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you at the next conversation. Thank you. Thank you to our translator. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Laura. Yes, thank you to our translator, too. That was awesome. And thank you for thinking about accessibility and, and our deaf population. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. We appreciate you.